Hailing from the great cold state of Alaska, I am the Frozen Gamer 87. Welcome to Dads in Gaming, where I interview fellow dads who are not only gamers but content creators. That content may be gaming related or maybe something else entirely, but every one of these gentlemen are passionate both about video games and being dads. Joining me today for the ninth Dads in Gaming is yet another very special guest. He is the man whose love for Bojangles Buttery Biscuits is matched only by his hatred of freaking Comcast. One of the founders of Married to the Games podcast, Mr. Timothy Hall. How are you doing today, sir? Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. I've wanted to talk to you for years, and uh, <laughs> it's very cool to finally have the opportunity to do so uh, in a way that's not just me whining about you guys picking on Nintendo when I was a Nintendo fanboy. So, <laughs> Chickens have come home to roost on that one. We'll get into that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts because I was always curious because I, I seem to remember you left Married to the Games before the Switch got announced, and so I never got to hear what you thought about it. So I'm sure we'll get into that as we go through the questions here. Um, but before we get into the main interview, what are you currently playing? Oh, man, it's kind of runs the gamut. I think so <laughs> yesterday um, and, and many days before this, I have been crushing Tetris 99 like crazy. Nice. I know... It's kind of an older game, but mm -hmm. every time I sit down and play it, I'm always like, oh, I just want to get a couple games in. And then I just sit there for hours because I'll get, you know, uh, 30th, 20th. And then last yesterday I got down. I think the closest I got was like eighth place. I've been playing that game for years and I love it. And uh, I mean, it's Tetris mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's kind right. of like the competitive nature of it makes it a little bit addictive. So that's a big one I've been playing. Also, Pokemon Quest, which is another kind of old game, but mm -hmm. it kind of scratches that itch for yeah. uh, kind of how I felt playing the old Pokemon games. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I still play uh, Gears 5 okay. uh, multiplayer, uh, even though it's been kind of hacked to death, I feel like. Um, but... Uh, also, uh, Dead Island 2, I guess, was All my right. most recent nice. game. Uh, I think I'm about halfway through that one, but uh, when I get time, yeah, playing the co-op on that has been quite fun. Very cool. Uh, with Gears, are you, are you playing that on Xbox or PC? So uh, I've been playing it on Xbox, and that's why I think we've been getting crushed so much. Mm. Um, I've noticed that a lot of people... It seems like a lot of people playing on PC have set up like hot keys and macros mm -hmm. and just yeah. stuff that I didn't think about, like going up and down hallways where you can kind of bounce between the walls. And I mean, you can just knowing what I know about IT, I, like I know I could set up macros to do right. that. And so the fact that they have pulled PC and Xbox players together has mm -hmm. made it less enjoyable, but we do still pull out ahead a lot. So it has it, it still is quite a bit fun. It's just as the player pool gets smaller and smaller, I think it gets harder to kind of um, compete against people who are hacking the game. Yeah. So, well, sure. ha hacking, quote unquote, I'll say. Right. Uh, yeah. Use, using enhancement. Mm -hmm. you know? Shortcuts and all that. So, yeah. 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 I, I never got into Gears of War at all, mostly because I didn't have an Xbox. And so um, even mm -hmm. though I have like a number of Xbox games on PC, I've, just Gears of War is a series I never got into. It was something I was interested in playing, but I just I never had the Xbox, and I don't know how many of them are actually on PC. I know that, like... Uh, I, th Sorry, I think it was from the first one. I think. Well, I, I, I think that I feel was like, Games for Windows I mean, game. yes, the, the first one came for Game for Windows Live, but I don't think two or three ever did, unless it just came sometime later. I'll have to look into that. You, you're probably right on that one. Yeah. Um... I mean, it's I possible. Mean, yeah, I, I can under, I can understand how how it would too, especially with the state it's in now. I mean, mm -hmm. Gears and Halo, I mean, they've fallen from great heights. I feel like so. Right. Um, keep keeping up with them as a fan has been a little bit disheartening, even though the games I feel like have gotten better over time. Uh, 
the problem has just been that yeah the community is so small now mm-hmm. and it's kind of like i said like pc and xbox players so it's i mean i love playing pc games but there's there's definitely an advantage to playing with a mouse and keyboard i feel right. like so um keeping those player pools separate for a long time i felt like kept that multiplayer experience uh more energized on the mm-hmm. xbox but yeah. now you know I mean, to be fair, it has fallen from its heyday. Gears 3, I feel like, was kind of the peak. And yeah. then from there, it's kind of gone downhill, I guess. And I would say the same thing for Halo. You know, I was going to mention it later yeah. on in the interview. But uh, Halo 3, I just remember getting that on midnight release when those used to be a thing. Yeah. Which I, I, I know that they still technically do that with digital. But, I mean, I really do miss going to GameStop or... Best Buy and waiting in a line and getting it and going home and playing it and knowing that, you know, we took work off the next day so we would play it at night. And uh, I just it, I, I just remember booting into Halo 3 and there was like a million players online synonymously yeah. like in that game. It was like, I think because of the variety of releases nowadays and the frequency with which we get them, I don't. I just don't feel like there's going to be that kind of experience again on a multiplayer game like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I could be wrong, though. There could be a ton of games out there that are getting that level of play. Um, But for me, it it, those games both kind of fell off at their three was like kind of the pinnacle of their popularity. Yeah. I wonder if they sorry have, for the tangent. There's oh, no, going to be a lot. No, of go, go ahead. So. That's I, I'm all for it. That's that's what we're here for. So um, I feel like there was something else I was going to ask related to that. Oh, yeah, I was going to say with the midnight launches. Did you do the midnight launch for the switch? Oh, gosh, uh, I don't think I did for that one. I think I'm trying to remember. I think when the switch came out, I was out in L.A. at the time. Ah, OK. And um I think I was just getting moved in, honestly. So it was like kind of hard to pay attention to. But I will say when the SNES Classic came out, we definitely went and got that on launch day. And we went down to, there was like an Amazon was doing like a, oh gosh, it's it's hard to remember. It was like a a truck thing where they were doing like a launch day, um, Oh gosh, like almost like a golden ticket type thing. Like you had to get an email in your Prime and then bring that with you, mm-hmm. or you got an email from Prime and brought it with you to pick up your classic because they were sh- there were shortages of them. Mm-hmm. I can't remember what the name of it was. I just remember being down there and uh, texting Gabe like, "Hey, like we just picked it up." <laughs> so nice. it was a really cool experience. Yeah, it's a cool device. I, I've only I only got to play mine a little bit here and there. But it's more just because I do more handheld gaming than anything else. And so, Mm -hmm. I mean, like, that's definitely I I like I didn't bother with the NES classic because I just didn't really have nostalgia for those. But the the Super Nintendo stuff, there was just there was just enough games that either I had nostalgia for or really wanted to play to where, um, you know, I ended up getting that one of one of which was uh, Link to the Past, which I still have yet to finish. And I I remember I remember from listening to recently listening to the old episodes of married to the games that that was one of your favorites so oh absolutely and and the older i get the more i realize that games become our favorite because not only because like it can be a great game and we enjoy playing it but also because like it is that time in our lives and for me link to the past was kind of like trying to remember i think i was eight or nine and it was just like one of those summers like Mm -hmm. just a really enjoyable moment in my life and uh so that's that also kind of boosts the game for me i guess Mm -hmm. um but when i go back to some of those games now like yeah i'll play them for a little bit and i remember and then i kind of like put them down and go to the newer stuff like remembering like oh yeah like it was not just that this is a good game but also it was kind of where i was at the time right and so that's that's another reason i got the snes classic because it was just something that i had at that age and uh, wanted to share those feelings I had, you know, uh, with my daughter growing up, you know, I wanted to show her like, Hey, these are the games that I played. And, you know, uh, this, this was what Nintendo was, you know, when dad was little. So yeah, 
we've had a lot of those moments, like playing Pokemon Quest together. Like she absolutely loves that game, and I get to tell her like, hey, you know, the first game of this came out uh, when I was. I want to say in Japan it came out when I was like 10, maybe. But when it came to the States, I think I was 12 at the time. And I was like, yeah, that your dad had a Game Boy and he was walking around playing this silly little game. And I showed her the original and she's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like you you played this? Like this just looks so different. She's like, the characters look so cute. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it was pretty quaint, I'll say. So, but uh, it's really fun to get to share that as a dad. Like Definitely. Definitely sharing those kind of experiences that you had growing up with gaming. So for sure the switch for me was awesome because, and I'll say this when the Wii U came out, I was like, they're going for something, but I don't think they stuck the landing. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was a technology thing and that's, I mean, the switch pretty much proved it was a technology thing right. that they Absolutely. were, that had hindered them with the Wii U. Uh, because when the switch came out, I was like, as a new dad at the time, mm -hmm. uh, this is perfect. Yeah. I can take it everywhere. Uh, like if I need to, if we're going on a trip to grandma's, like we can take the switch with us or, mm -hmm. you know, if we're, um, uh, you know, doing a day trip, we can take the switch with us. She can play it for a little bit in the car. You know, it was just kind of, it, it really made gaming, uh, not only like it was great that you could take it portably, but you could also mm -hmm. just bring it home and plug it right. in just like a console game. Mm -hmm. Use your same controllers like your pro controllers. So um, I feel like the switch was what I wanted from the Wii U. And so I was really excited to get it. Yeah. Like we love playing the switch and we'll get more into that later. I'm sure. Very cool. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and get into the main questions of the interview. So uh, we're going to start off first with Married to the Games. Now, obviously, it's been a number of years since you've been a part of it, but you were one of the founders, and you were there for over 200 episodes. When, when was it that you left? Uh, I think it was near 200. I think it was like maybe 190 or 191. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I left the show and then came back and did 200. That's right. Like the second okay. part of 200. Okay. Yep, I do remember that now. It kind of blurs together because it's been so many years, but oh my goodness! I, I mean, know. it's it's like I, like I I never f forgot you. Like you were, I mean, of course, because I, I I started listening around episode thirty, and I mean, but I you know like it was episode thirty that um, I had just started my other podcast, the Frozen Gamers podcast, and Gabe had started following me on Twitter, and then he reached out to me, and I start I started following you guys, and and um. Then I just went back to the first episode and listened from there and then got caught up and, you know, I've been listening ever since for 11 years for me. But mm -hmm. anyway, um, so with Married to the Games, what was, at least at the time of founding, even though it hasn't really changed, what was uh, Married to the Games all about? Uh, I think we wanted to just show people like, f um, you know, family guys talking about gaming. Um uh, Router and I had a friendship over the Giant Bombcast, and I, we really liked those kind of shows and like the IGN shows. And the thing that was a common factor with those shows was that it was industry people talking industry knowledge, mm -hmm. insider knowledge, stuff that, you know, kind of the common gamer i guess didn't really have access to mm -hmm. whereas we were more like hey we're enthusiastic about playing games and enthusiastic about our families and so like let's make a podcast that kind of reflects that just a real optimism about gaming and um hanging out with our friends and talking about gaming and kind of get it, trying to get our families <laughs> into gaming you know trying to kind of sneak that in um and so just like, yeah, the Everyman show. Like, we wanted to do something that was a little bit more uh, down to earth, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, I, and that's one of the things I always appreciated about about it. I mean, both in the early days and, you know, currently, just the difference in that, just how you guys were very relatable. And uh, th yeah. that's, a, that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> I was like, tr I was fishing for that word. Mm -hmm. Um the, the thing you said about Twitter, uh, what Gabe and I would do running the Twitter uh, was, you know, 
follow and interact with everyone we could because mm-hmm. we were yeah. like, we want to make this a community podcast. Yeah. We want to get super involved with the people who do the show and the feedback that we would get from people too. We would take that to heart and change mm-hmm. elements of the show based on the feedback because I remember even like um, when we started out and s- some listeners may remember the uh, question of the week we would put the question of the week out there and then you wouldn't hear about it the next episode. Yeah. And somebody had mentioned to us, like, I think it, it might've been on Twitter. Um, like, Hey guys, like you do this question of the week. It'd be cool if you would like read off some of our answers. And we were like, Oh, duh. Like <laughs> we do this question of the week and then it's just radio silent. Of course we should read your guys' answers. Cause like, we're trying to build a community here and like, you know, we have, uh, feelings about games. People have feelings about games. We want to kind of like get this feedback and put it into a community effort. And so I think that was the strength of the show is that getting to kind of interact with listeners a lot led to episodes 100, 200. And then, you know, as the mantle was taken up by uh, Ed and Chris, 300, 400, 500, 600. Mm-hmm. Like when we get together and, it's it's a family getting together right. like it's a really uh close knit community and so that's kind of what we were looking to create and i mean there may be um many more efforts to do that since we started the show back in back when we started the show though in 2012 i mean it was mostly industry podcasts mm-hmm. in fact like twitch streaming i don't think was a major thing at that time where people would actually gain followers and create communities. It was more, like I said, like an industry show uh, business at the time. Yeah, uh, I could be a little bit mistaken on that, but I know that just doing Married to the Games, w- people listening to Married to the Games st- went off and started their own shows as well. And yep. like, I could not be more happy that that's happened because like I said, like I want communities to flourish throughout gaming as you know we're fathers gaming you know we're family people gaming so um i want that voice to also kind of get out there you know i think actually i'll i will say that i was influenced by uh the cag cast uh too because they were very much normal guys doing a podcast as well and so i had been listening to them and the giant bombcast since uh, probably, oh gosh, 2006 maybe or 2005. It was a long time ago. But getting to listen to them and hear how their lives developed, uh, it was very special to me to get to like experience that progression. And so um, getting to do that with Mary to the Games was like pretty fun documenting our journey. So uh, and getting to share it with everybody. So yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it went off on a huge stand. No, no, it's like I said, that's what we're here for. So, um, but yeah, that was, it's definitely cool thinking about, about all the changes that have happened over the years, both in the lives of, of you and the other guys who started the podcast, as well as the guys who you know took over after you left. Um, and then, you know, just like personally how my life has changed since I started listening to the podcast and, um, I mean, of course, there's been, you know, ups and downs in everybody's lives. Obviously, the biggest down recently, the fact that Gabe passed away. Um, Absolutely. You know, and of course, I mean, you you knew him, you know, far better than I did. The extent of how I knew him was the listening to the podcast and the, the little bit of conversation I had with him here and there. Um, but like I, you know, my wife and I were able to go to 500 because by that point we had moved down to Missouri from Alaska. And so... Uh, we were finally able to meet Gabe and Tim and um, and Chris and Ed. And it was just really cool. You know, we had a really cool conversation with Gabe and we're able to, I mean, we were talking about, you know, just raising kids in this world. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, we told him about the fact that we were going to be starting homeschooling and he was just super encouraging in that and, and everything else. And um, fortunately, we didn't get to really talk to him much at 600 because um, he, he had to go off to get something to eat potentially there was some issues with his illness as well um that we didn't know about at the time and um he said you know stay right there i'll be back and then he of course got stopped on the way back and never got back to us which you know 
I mean, everybody wanted to talk to Gabe, so it was completely understandable. But anyway, yeah. um, all that being said, so you kind of touched on this already, but um, well, I mean, you really did basically touch on it, but what specifically led you to create the podcast? Was it just the influence of having listened to other podcasts and wanting to create this community or was there more to it? Yeah, there, there was, and, uh, I don't think I ever shared this, um, story on the, uh, married to the games, but there was this experience I had in high school where I got to go shadow at a clear channel radio station and got to like sit in with the broadcasters there. And I was like, you know, uh, these guys are just talking and joking and having a great time. And like, they get to do this as a job. Like, this is so awesome. And so like broadcasting had always been kind of one of those things where I was like, I'd really like, like, like pipe dream type thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was like, you know, just knowing the friendship I had with Tim and he had a friendship with Gabe. And after we got, I, I mean, after we got to talk one time, I knew I was like, Oh, we could, I think we got something here just talking to each other. Like, I think we could have a lot of fun with this. And like I said, like I had wanted to do broadcasting. And so I was like, cool, cool. We get to do, you know, a talk show, basically a podcast. And um, I think I had a lot of things to say about Comcast and stuff like that. So um, I wasn't trying to like, you know, launch off a soapbox, but I was like, I mean, I, I'm at the time I was a pretty highly opinionated person and I was like, I want to, I like these topics are something we should cover. And I think that a lot of people are going to relate to that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, Hey, like I'm a gamer and Comcast just ruined my night and I'm going to talk about it, you know, or something. So, um, just wanting to make people laugh too, because there's a, as you, as you said, like, raising kids in this world and there is a lot of stuff to be worried about i mean we just went through a pandemic and mm -hmm. it though it it kind of feels like yeah like it's been gone for a while it still was pretty recent so right. in the grand scheme of things and i th i see like how my daughter was affected like not being at school for that time and i mm -hmm. kind of think like you know there are some things to be worried about but um you have a group of guys that you can laugh with every week shoot yeah. You know, it makes life better. Yeah, for sure. It's funny. The the last time I did uh, Dads in Gaming um, was during 2020 because I did I did all the previous episodes during 2020. And so it was very interesting. You know, at the time we were like, OK, is it going to be we're going to move on? Are we act, is this actually going to be two weeks to slow the spread or is it going to be something beyond that? And obviously we weren't like talking about it really all that much. It's just at the time we didn't really know what was going on. And yeah. um, so it's just kind of interesting thinking about that compared to where we are today. But um, I digress. We, we're not going to get into all that topic because as relevant as it is to gaming in general and how it affected gaming and everything else, it's also just it's not the purpose of this. So, um, of course, it's as I mentioned before, you know, it's been a number of years since you've been a part of Married to the Games. Um, what do you think has kept it going all this time? I mean, they just did episode 606, I believe it was the last one. Yes, like it's like about 606 episodes. And, um, you know, even though you haven't been a part of it, what, what do you think has kept it going all this time? And do you miss it? Uh, the community is definitely the reason it's still going. Um, just, f and it, I know it's going to be hard not to bring up you know, what had just happened with Gabe, mm -hmm. but, um, reconnecting with those listeners that I knew, uh, from doing the show and seeing a whole bunch of new people, you know, the community is like a strong, uh, support group for, for all of like me coming kind of back into it and getting back into the discord. Like this mm -hmm. is a strong community, uh, really moving mountains, you know, and in, um, in God's love, really. Mm -hmm. And I think Gabe wouldn't have wanted it any other way, you right. know? Um, I think that just in seeing what the community does, it's like, um, you know, Gabe was carrying a torch and because he had a big community, uh, 
after leaving, you know, I think that God knew that we were all going to pick it up and carry it, you yeah. know, all each and every one of us. And so like that light that he was carrying lives on in the community. And I think that's what's kept it so strong as a show. Do I miss it? Um, I feel like, uh, I feel like when I was, when I was getting close to leaving the show, like I was already, um, uh, needing more family time and yeah. my daughter was on the way. And so, um, I was falling off of gaming pretty hard by the end there. Um, so I was kind of like, you know, I like when I had listened to, um, Chris coming on the show and Ed coming on the show, I was like, these guys are way more knowledgeable about gaming and they're way more up to date on, on releases than I am. I wish I had the time to play more, but I yeah. think that these guys are a better fit for a weekly podcast for sure. Um, I think in the, you know, I haven't done any podcasting since then. I think in the future, I'd probably be interested in like long form special documentary style projects, but that's cool. Um, for a weekly show, I think they fit the format so well. I think it's great, honestly. Yeah. So, uh, with, what they've uh what the podcast has become in the past i mean it's been eight years so that is their show and uh it's it's really great the way it is so i like it very cool did you did you keep listening after um after you left yeah i listened i listened for a little bit um but then i just kind of fell off like yeah life life kind of came up of course and I was in touch with Gabe. You know, I mentioned this on the Discord, too. I was in touch with Gabe for a while after, and then I think around uh, 2020, we got in touch because he had mentioned, like, oh, we might be doing an episode 400. Um, yeah, it, this was during that time. So mm-hmm. I had said, you know, um, we'll see what happens. Like, we'll see about getting together. And it just, unfortunately, we kind of fell off after that, like, yeah. communication. Uh, I regret not getting in touch with him because, you know, God had put him on my heart a lot over this Mm -hmm. past year. And I feel like, I feel like he was trying to say, you know, uh, I'm going to take, you know, Gabe and now would be a good time to say goodbye to him. And so I would say if, honestly, if God puts somebody on your heart, just reach out immediately, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, because... There's probably a good reason. Well, I don't even want to say probably. There is a good reason. Right. And, um, you know, I would have uh, wanted my friend to know, you know, that I was thinking about him. So I should have done that. Sorry to get a little, no, um, you know, somber. No, it's, but it's it, understandable. It, it, um, you know, uh, I think that... Um, the, th- the heartening thing, I would say, is that there is so much of Gabe recorded in this show mm-hmm. right? that, like, I can go back and listen to my buddy anytime. Yeah. Uh, when everybody said that they were kind of going back and listening to the old shows, which they've been doing for a while, I went back and started listening because I was kind of like, well, <laughs> like, I was like, man, like, I am so embarrassed of <laughs> that time of my life. I was like 20 in my twenties. And like I said, highly opinionated and, uh, some bad opinions I feel like, but, uh, I was like, man, like I want to go back and listen. Cause I want to listen to my buddy, yeah, you know, my buddy Gabe and my buddy Tim. So, and I had missed them a lot. Uh, I gave, you know, router, a, just a big hug when I saw him, I had, I had just missed him so much. Yeah. So on from that note, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, One thing I do just want to add briefly, and this is still on a bit of a somber note, but, you know, with the the thing about reaching out to people, like when when God puts them on your heart, um, you know, like there was in, I mean, after 2020, you know, like I had been separated from pretty much my entire family for several years because my parents moved down to California in 2015. Um, and they they decided they were moving down there before we found out we were expecting our firstborn, and mm-hmm. so they moved down there because my mom's mom wasn't doing that well health wise, and so they were moving down there to take care of her. And also, my mom was just getting tired of Alaska, which was understandable considering how cold it got. Um, but in um, you know, my dad passed away in 2018, and my mom decided in 2019 to move to uh, to Missouri so that she could 
I mean, you know, because there wasn't really any reason for her to stay in California with my dad gone. So her and my grandma moved yeah. out here. And um, after 2020, I just kind of, you know, I was getting tired, of course, of uh, being so far away from family because all of my family was in the lower 48, um, you know, Missouri, Nebraska, Massachusetts. And I, you know, was so far away from everybody. And then on top of that, I was really tired of the winters because it was just a really, really icy winter. And at that point, I had started like walking every day. So I got so Ugh. irritated at not being able to go out on walks because of how icy it was. Um, yeah. Because cleats only do so much. But <laughs> God, God, God put it on my heart to, um, you know, that it was time to leave. And Missouri seemed like the most logical place to go because my mom was there. You know, I didn't get. I got very short amount of time from the time that we found out my dad was dying to the time he actually died. I basically got one good day with him and, oh you know, cause he, he's, he died a little over a week after, after we found out that he had a massive brain tumor. And so Jeez. I, I wanted to be close to my mom, you know, figuring, Oh, she has, you know, however many years God has given her, but this way we can be close to my mom. We'll be close to my sister and her husband and her husband was the pastor of the church. And, you know, it was a church that had theology that matched more with where we were at. Um, and it was just like all sorts of good things. Um, you know, we started the process in January of that year and we found out in April because um, it was we, we knew it was going to be several months before we could actually move. We found out in April that my mom had stage four pancreatic cancer. And so mm -hmm. we got down and we were able to get a couple months with her before she passed away. So, um yeah. I mean, it was it was rough, but at the same time, it was a lot easier than it was with my dad, just because of the fact that we had that additional time had more with time, her. Yeah. And the thing about that also is that when I saw Gabe at 600, he I, I saw that he had lost a lot of weight. And my first thought was, mm -hmm. oh, he made some lifestyle changes. Um, you know, that's and, you know, I thought it was a positive thing, but then after he didn't show up for 601 and 602 and 603 and then like 604 they 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 let everybody know you know gabe hasn't been doing well health wise it just occurred to me he probably lost a lot of weight because he has cancer and he had had a pancreatic cancer scare a couple years prior but it turned out to not actually be that and i don't i still don't know what whether that was actually what he died from or if it was something else but um it's just like, I wish I had thought at that time to say, hey, Gabe, so, I mean, you know, I noticed you lost a lot of weight. I mean, is it, was it a, a choice or is there something going on? And because, mm -hmm. because my mom lost a ton of weight when she, when she had pancreatic cancer and mm -hmm. it was just, you know, loss of appetite, not eating all of that. So anyway, um, I know it's like not a positive thing, but all that is just to say that you're absolutely right. When, when God puts someone on your heart, you've got to reach out to them. Don't wait because yeah, you never yeah. know. So, Dude, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your mom and dad. Yeah. It's I, life changes. Yeah. Man. I mean, it's, it's just, it's something that I've had time to move on past. And, you know, I miss my parents. I wish they were still around, but I'm also, you know, like I, I know where they are. I, I don't have any doubts about that. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's been good from that standpoint and that's the best kind of reassurance right you know because um even with gabe it's like when ed shared his story and i mentioned this to ed when i saw him um i felt so much better uh mm -hmm. because i was like yeah you know what the way that gabe lived it would make sense that he was done yeah like and it was time to go um so that reassurance that up even to the end i think one of the like I, somebody had told me that he was saying you know the king is on the throne mm -hmm. and i was like my i will never forget that he said that yeah. ever absolutely uh, and that will be a heartening thing for the rest of my life yeah well and this is exactly what i talk about when i say that the community supports one another mm -hmm. right here is right. that you know we go through life but we um have so much to encourage each other or we have so so much ability to encourage each other in the lord and walk together Absolutely. and 
you know, any advice that I could give would just be, I'm 37 now, so I, I'm as old as Router was when he started the show with right. me. Right. Um, but, the, the, you know, what I would say is live all in, you know, because mm-hmm. you never know. You never know how much time you're going to get, you know, yeah. with people. So living all in is the best choice. And, uh, you know. Right. Hey, that's the, the Gabe's legacy lives on, you know, mm-hmm. in all of us. So Absolutely. Well, uh, we, just one one quick question before we get into like back to the band questions, and that's just um, now I'm remembering from from recently listening to the first episode that you were 26 at the time that you started, so that would mean you were born at 86 or 87. Yeah, 86. Okay, that's what I thought. So you're you're about a year older than me, or not quite, because I'm 37 now, but I was born in 87. Oh, so. okay. Anyway, gotcha. but yeah, I thought that was funny too because when I listened to that episode, it's like. <laughs> Router was 37, had been married for 14 years. I'm oh, 37 man. now. It will be 15 years in a couple of weeks. And so it's just it's it's just kind of funny, the difference, because, of course, you know, back then I would have been 25 or tw- maybe 26, depending. Well, yeah. I, I think when I started listening, I was 26, but that was also, well, I don't know. Anyway, the point is, is that it was a long time ago. <laughs> so, well, it, it's there. it's funny when you're when you're 26, the the way I can think about it is when you're 26, you're mid twenties. When you're 37, you're like, dude, I'm almost 40. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I think about is like, yeah, I turned 38 this month. I'm almost 40. So I'm really close. Well, and, I mean, the good uh, thing about that stuff. Yeah. The good thing about okay. being 37 is that then you can quote the great, the great peasant philosopher, Dennis. I'm 37. I'm not old. You know, from Monty Python <laughs> oh, and the Holy Grail. So yeah. Yeah. As it went, when I, when I, I mean, I, you know, it was first watched that when I was like 14 or 15. And ever since then, you know, I thought when I turn 37, I'm going to be saying that because, <laughs> because why not? <laughs> there you go, man. Uh, anyway, so let's get into some more positive things here. Uh, when did you start gaming and where did you get your start? Like what platform and what, what was your first game? Uh, I, my earliest gaming memory, and I've mentioned this um, probably on the show a few times was, mm. uh, you know, at my aunt's house playing her Atari 2600. Uh, and I think I was like three or four. Um, I'm pretty sure I was three because I just remember not knowing what I was doing very much. And of course, like, um, remembering like, uh, Pac-Man and Raiders of the Lost Ark and like some of those more simple games. Um, but like my first concrete gaming memories would probably be NES Mario, like the first one and duck hunt. Cause they, I think they came with, I know I had the action set and they, mm. I think they came with it, but for some reason I remember getting the power pad shortly after that. And I yeah. can't remember if that came out before then it would have been 1990. So, okay. And those are my like earliest concrete memories. And I, I know I've mentioned it before. Back then, you could just get games for so cheap. There was no yeah. eBay or, I mean, there was like a trading post. But <clears throat> before eBay, I mean, my parents would take me to yard sales and I'd just like point to a box of games, you know, have my parents ask how much and they'd be like 10 bucks. And I'd be like, I mean, I was set for like a year, you know. <laughs> just off of the NES stuff. So, um, but another early memory of mine was getting the Sonic, uh, Genesis kit when it came out. Mm. <clears throat> Cause I remember my dad hooked it up and then, you know, Christmas morning. Um, I think I like, I'd opened a bunch of stuff and I was like, kind of like, Oh, like, you know, did I end up getting a Genesis? And then they were like, you know, go upstairs and look. And upstairs was the Genesis hooked up with, Sonic playing. I was like, oh my gosh. Like, that was probably one of my best Christmas memories. So, or early gaming memories is getting the Genesis. And I was, I was a Genesis kid for a while. So, I didn't get yeah. the Super Nintendo until, um, I think like 93 or 94. So, it was a little older. Very nice. Well, how do you respond to people who think you're too old to be gaming? Uh, it's kind of a, a funny thing is, um, you get those looks from people, especially when you're playing games like Fallout or Skyrim, where, Mm -hmm. you know, you're dunking, you're dumping 
80 hours into a game and they're just kind of like, mm, what are you doing? Like, what? like I even used to get those looks when I would play Hearthstone because my coworkers knew that I was going out at lunch to play Hearthstone. And um, <coughs> I think my answer to that, honestly, is, you know, the average gaming age is quite old at this point. So right. it's like, ah, I'm kind of young for a gamer, I think. Uh, especially, I mean, I meet so many people that have those same memories like that I do of getting the first Mortal Kombat, for example. And they're much older than me, so I'm like, well, I got that game when I was like seven, so you were in a much better like age group than me when I got that game. So yeah. I can understand that ga- gaming is kind of, you know, it's kind of grown up, I feel like. it's It's when I was first getting into gaming, I think... There were more mature games still, but not on not in, like when Mortal Kombat came out. I kind of feel like that changed everything, and so the average gamer being older, um, I think yeah, that's what I would tell them. I would say, well, the average gamer is like forty nine, so I think <laughs> I'm good, yeah. you know. Very. But cool. also, you can always just say, hey, I'm gaming with my child. So yeah, you know. yeah, use that excuse. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's like it's like when you when you buy toys you had when you were a kid and you're like well it's for my kid yeah yeah, yeah that's, exactly. what, that's what it's for <laughs> i did that for a little bit and then i realized like oh yeah like they're not going to care about that stuff as much right. as you exactly do. Like, it makes a lot of sense it's just like when so because my dad my dad used to do that same thing with me and it was like well i don't care about rocky and bullwinkle or i don't care about speed racer <laughs> you know yeah. like i get it so so with Rogue, it's like, well, you know, Transformers are cool, but yeah, you know, like she has her own things that she kind of likes. So yeah, makes sense. Definitely. Uh, well, what would you say are your top five games of all time or even just right now? So when I thought about this uh, question, I was thinking about kind of that thing we talked about earlier with how did I feel when I played these games? Mm-hmm. And so like, Zelda is still one number one for me and always will be. Um, mm-hmm. It's just time of my life, perfect game. Um, also up there is Final Fantasy VII. I think I mm. was like 12 when I played that game. And same thing there. It's like that was a pretty good age to play that game, especially with the kind of things that it tackled. Mm-hmm. Um, and gosh, yeah. I just remember like renting that. I think I rented it from Blockbuster and played it the whole way through the first time and then bought it later. Nice. Um, but it was definitely like a pivotal game for me. Um, you know, way up there too is XCOM. I kind of feel like, and this will kind of dive into, I guess, later in the show, but, uh, XCOM, I feel like is kind of an underrated franchise because I feel like in, uh, gosh, when did that first, that, well, the first one came out on PC, but like the first newer one, I guess, was like 2011, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, for it to be 13 years since the kind of the relaunch of that game um, and it only getting two games, it, it seems like it's been kind of undersold, in my opinion. But I lo- absolutely love that game. And I remember the first time I played XCOM, uh, I got four hours into it. I played it like in a four hour sitting and something glitched out and it did not save my game. And I was like happy to replay it. I was like, I don't even care. I'm going to play it again. Don't even care. So that game just, you know, completely uh, blew me away. Uh, And two as well. I played two late, like uh, probably about five years ago. Um, Skyrim is up there too, um, just because I didn't play Oblivion, and so playing Skyrim, where it's like I'm walking like out of the kind of opening sequence, and I can just go anywhere and do anything in this medieval land, like I was completely blown away. I know it's not as deep as like some RPGs are, but for me, it was just like I was just completely amazed with the the breadth of content in that Mm -hmm. game i feel like and the ability to just literally do whatever you wanted like go anywhere you can join guilds you can you know make alliances like it's just i mean there was nothing like it i mean 
I, and I put Fallout 3 on my list too because, yeah, that one came before and it did a lot of those same formulas, but I, I like the content in Skyrim better. Mm-hmm. But Fallout 3 for me was still, I mean, pivotal game, like completely blown away by the immersion and the ability to go anywhere. Uh, and luckily I didn't hit a lot of bugs that, that people were talking about. So I, I did come to it a couple years after, but... Uh, gosh, that game just completely blew me away. Uh, and, you know, I would say an honorable mention would probably be Uncharted 2. Okay. Um, because uh, I had just gotten a PS3, and so that was the first game I got with it. Cause nice. <coughs> Uncharted 2 kind of brought a bunch of people in, because I, I think it came out when the Slim came out. And Ooh. so I already had a 360, and I was like, when the Slim came out, they dropped the price. I think it was like yeah. two ninety nine. Mm-hmm. I was like, perfect time. This game's coming out. And I really want to play it. And Uncharted 2, luckily, like you didn't have to have played the first one, I think, to enjoy it. Right. Uh, but, I mean, the writing, everything was just so tight on that game. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, that definitely makes my list as well. Very, very good. I'll do a second honorable mention to Halo 3. Sorry, because the multiplayer was just unreal. So we loved it. Yeah. Uh, I did have a question about Skyrim. Just try not to go off on too much of a tangent here. But um, we'll we'll, we'll say a two-question thing. One is, did you end up getting that one on Switch? Uh, I didn't. I was close to doing it the thing that kind of drew me off of it was the fact that they had the 60 fps on xbox yeah that's that's a good reason yeah because after i started like so i got my series s uh i want to say like when it almost when it first came out so i got Mm -hmm. the series s i got the series x later on but most of the games were already 60 when the series S like with the series S and I was like, Mm. I can't go back. Right. Like it's just too smooth. Yeah. Like the response times. Absolutely. 100 with the switch. 50% agree. Yeah. With with the switch, like it's cool to have it portable. Mm. So from that perspective, like I, I mean, I still would consider getting it. I will say I played outer worlds on the switch. And so that, that was rough. It was 30. It was rough, yeah. I mean, it would drop down to, like, 15 a lot. But yeah. um, for me, it was like, okay, I get it. It's a portable experience. I can take it with me and, mm-hmm. you know, kind of have fun that way. So yeah. um, the thing the thing that kind of, uh, I guess, chained me to a console is working from home. It's like, yeah. well, you know, I'm not really going to the office anymore. So now that I work from home, it's like I can get that. Uh, better what I feel like is a smoother gaming experience I guess oh yeah well uh, I mean on six, those, ty- on those right. games yeah I mean 60 frames is is always better than 30 there's pretty much no reason I mean there's some some games that doesn't matter as much but it's still just mm-hmm. always more responsive and I mean like I played Skyrim on the Switch that's the first place I really played it and oh, um, cool so did I you mean, get the Zelda armor and stuff yeah, I mean, it was stuff you get pretty early in the game. It was kind of worthless, oh, to be okay. honest. But um, it was, I mean, I mean, like I had already um, modded Oblivion to get Zelda armor and stuff previously on PC. So it was, oh, that's cool. It wasn't as big of a deal to me from that standpoint, but it was still cool. And, um, you know, of course, having it on the portable. But um, like I, I did Outer Worlds briefly on Switch as well. And mostly just because it was cheap at the time. I mean, I think I got it for like 20 bucks or something. And Mm -hmm. I I enjoyed it for a while, despite all the problems. Um, But then it just got to the point where the frame rate was just so low that it was just really painful to play. And then I Mm -hmm. ended up just buying it on PC when it was cheap. And it's like Steam Deck, I can I can get 40 to 60, depending on what how I set up the settings. And on on my desktop, I can get 120 frames. So it's like, yeah, that's that's just just a tiny bit better. But oh, yeah. Anyway, um. One more question with Skyrim, and that is Stealth Archer, or did you actually do something different? Uh, I mean, I always went in gun bl- guns blazing, even if though they didn't have guns in that game. Right. So uh, I, w- w- having re-listened to the first couple episodes of Married to the Games, like 
I remember Gabe was talking about Hitman, and I was like, oh, I could never play a game like that because I literally would just go in guns blazing every time. Yeah. And I'm still like that. I think it's just because I want to get it done quickly. Yeah. So it's like, uh, I don't want to have to, like, kind of sneak around. I will say there was one boss, though, where I could sneak and hit him and then run away and then come back, like, sneak, hit him, run. And so I did that several times to beat one of the bosses in Skyrim. But Nice. Uh, other than that, yeah, just always kind of running in with a big sword or you know, a big axe. I didn't even do the uh, shields either. I always had like an axe and then a spell on my left hand. Yeah. So it was like axe sense. and right hand, spell and left hand, and just consistently healing myself and slashing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Whatever works. Probably the worst way to play it. But, eh. <laughs> yeah. My, but everybody plays Stealth Archer for the most part. So that's... Really? Not as, I, Well, it's like extremely common. Like, I, it's funny because when I started yeah. playing, I wanted to change things up from how I played Oblivion, where I was just going in with the sword and whatever else, you know, up close and personal, by playing Stealth Archer. Mm-hmm. And then I found out, oh, lots of people do Stealth Archer. In fact, it's like one of the most common things to where it's a meme. And anyway... <laughs> Oh yeah. Until you take an arrow to the knee. Then you right. Can't do exactly. Anymore, I yeah. All right. Well, um, I mean, you, you kind of already answered this, but do you have anything further to s- when it comes to the most underrated game you've played or would you just I say want XCOM? To, yeah, definitely. I want to mention legacy of Cain because, okay. um, so that was a PlayStation game. The first mm-hmm. one, right? Uh, like PlayStation one, mm-hmm. uh, but they had one on, Dreamcast called Soul Reaver. That was mm-hmm. uh, one of the ones I played, and um, I mean that series like got the short end of the stick, man. Because I feel like there's enough there to like kind of jump off and do a Witcher style game, mm-hmm. and it would be. I think it would have been beloved, like on the 360 era, if they had done a game with a new game with Legacy of Cain that was more like a Skyrim or a Witcher, mm-hmm. like combination style game just because it seems like a it there would be a cool story to kind of work on i think so i mean just something different you know right and i, I maybe skyrim kind of touched on that with the uh, dlc they did with like the vampire mm-hmm. dlc that they did um they kind of i guess scratched that itch maybe but i feel like um legacy of kane could have done something or they could have done something with it. Also, if they would have continued Force Unleashed, I think there was something they could have done there. Um, I feel like... I don't feel like the first one was underrated necessarily because I think it sold well, but it seems like they put a lot less effort into the second one, and that's probably why it fell off so hard. Yeah. I mean, the new games from EA, like the Jedi Survivor, mm-hmm. and I feel like those have probably eclipsed what that was, but... I kind of feel like uh, there was opportunity there to do a little better on subsequent games for Force Unleashed. So yeah, yeah, with the Legacy uh, of there's Ca- all. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say with Legacy of Cain, um, like I I remember watching my cousin play Soul Reaver back in the day on PlayStation One, and um, I always was interested in checking it out, and then I finally like grabbed it on Vita several years ago and tried playing a little bit and I didn't get very far. And I think it's just because I was like in the middle of other games. And so I kind of felt bad starting another game when I was not done with anything else, but I did eventually um, try jumping back into it. I just uh, emulate it on my steam deck. So you get better, better controls, better resolution, stuff like that. Um, But I still haven't really played through it, but I do have, I think I, I bought all the other, Legacy of Kane games, uh, most of which came after Soul Reaver. It's just that they basically like stopped around PS2 era, or you know, the, yeah, they the last had, games like, were in like PS2 game and it fell off. Yeah, yeah, because I played that PS2 game and I was just like, it really wasn't wasn't hitting it. I think so. Yeah. Um, but also too with Star Wars. Now that I mentioned it, I had. J- I took my daughter to see episode one in theaters on Friday. Yeah. And she really enjoyed it. I was like, you know, I know that the prequels, like after the prequels, like came and went, like they got a lot of hate. And Mm -hmm. that's kind of why, like at the beginning of the force awakens, it says like, you know, this will begin to make everything right. You know, that, that quote at the beginning. 
Um, but like looking back on it now, I'm like, like I took her to see it and she loved it. I was like, this is a perfectly acceptable kids movie. So I yeah. think like, I think the place that some of us were in when those movies came out was probably like, eh, we're a little old. This feels like a kid's movie. So like, you know, we're going to kind of like push this to the wayside, but because we kind of grew up, I, th- I, I mean, I, at least I did like with the original trilogy. Right. And so yeah. those were kind of like my movies. Mm-hmm. And so when I went to go see the prequels, it was kind of like, yeah, I mean, it's not as good, but going and seeing it with my daughter, like the episode one, like, Mm-hmm. Totally holds up as a kid's movie. They could probably remove about, I would say, 20 minutes of the trade negotiation, blah, yeah. blah, blah stuff. Because, <laughs> I mean, I could tell she was getting a little bored during those parts. But yeah. um, the character action and stuff like that is perfectly acceptable mm-hmm. for a movie. So, yeah, And the story I, is all right. So, I have to say that after... Uh, what I consider to be the travesty of the sequel trilogy, which as far as I'm concerned, it's not canon. Um, uh, the prequels are not that bad. And I mean, of course, I, <laughs> I, I am with you 100%. The originals are are the best. Um, mm-hmm. but the prequels, I, I, I've also just like, even even before the sequel trilogy came out, I came to appreciate the prequels. Not, not like, I, I still think the originals are the best, but the prequels, they still feel like Star Wars. And it's because you have that, regardless of all the weird stuff that Lucas did, the reality is it still feels like a George Lucas Star Wars movie. You know, all three of them feel that way, whereas the sequels are disjointed and just, you know, I'm not going to get into that because that's not what we're doing. It feels like there was a vision with the first movie, but after that, it feels like there wasn't like a kind of overview. Yeah, there was no, what are we going to do with all of this? Yeah. Um, but you know, and that's besides the point. The thing I was mentioning though, was there was a game that came out when episode one came out called Jedi power battles. Oh. That was fantastic. Hmm. Awesome game, but they never followed it up. And so I was like, man, there, there were, I mean, it, I, I'm bringing up LucasArts, but really hmm. it feels like there were many kind of lost opportunities to continue those types of games. Hmm. I mean, we still, we do have new star Wars games coming out and there's even a new one out. What was it out like this week maybe, or it was out pretty recently. Um, um well there's outlaws coming out in August. Outlaws. Oh, it's coming out in August. Oh, okay. Yeah. Never mind. I just got my mag. I got a magazine for it. Gotcha. But, um, that's why I thought it was coming now, but, um, yeah, like, I mean, there's still games coming out, but I feel like, I mean, there is a lot of opportunity to bring back arcade experiences. Another one I had thought about was uh, I used to play this baseball game called the bigs and they only made the bigs and the bigs too. They never made any more after that. And I was like, where's my arcade baseball game? Like, I just want the big, dumb, fun baseball game. And when it comes to star Wars, like I kind of want the big, dumb, fun lightsaber game. You know, I'm kind of hoping that maybe because the prequels are coming back to theaters like somebody will catch fire and say like hey we should make another you know silly lightsaber battles game i mean i think there's room for it co-op is like it 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 feels like there are more it feels like there are more like arcadey co-op experiences now than there were when i was doing the podcast mm-hmm. uh and so, like, I think there's opportunity to do something like that as a, you know, even if it was like a Ninja Turtle style brawler, like I would still yeah. absolutely love something like that. So, yeah, that would be pretty cool, definitely. Well, what game or game series is your favorite? So, with Zelda being my favorite, like, game, like all time period I realized like I tried to get into other Zelda games like later on and they Mm -hmm. just never hooked me the way that Mm -hmm. Link to the Past did and I think it has a lot to do with just that top down Mm -hmm. like kind of style gameplay that I really liked Um, so if I had to come up with like a favorite game series like I would love for it to be Zelda but Zelda would be like favorite game uh 
favorite series, it would be it would be kind of. I mean, I, I think it would be Elder Scrolls, but it's just based on Skyrim because unfortunately I haven't played Oblivion. So really, I could say Fallout because I played Fallout 3, Fallout New Vegas, Fallout 4, Fallout 76, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, Fallout 2. Um, so I, because I've played all those games and enjoyed every single one, I think that's my answer, really. I mean, absolutely loved them. Fallout 76, I said unfortunately because I played it when it came out and it kind of wasn't my thing. Yeah. Like I was like, there's no quest giver. There's no, you know, like, sure, I could set up my camp, but there's no like place, like there's no place I can just go and it be my place bespoke and have nobody running around throwing their tents down in front of my, you know, place because it was multiplayer. The yeah. thing that was like so crazy playing that game is you would literally be in a field, like a desolate field, and then all of a sudden a giant mansion would like pop up in your face. I was like, what is going on? Like this <laughs> game is so weird. Creation was, engine for like, you. That, that literally <laughs> would happen. No, no, it was because it was a multiplayer game. So you would get well, into these too. sessions with people. Yeah, that these people that had mansions. Uh, as their campsites. And so they would just pop up in the middle of nowhere because you can take your camp with you and just deploy it. And I was like, I don't know if this game is for me. Because like, I kind of, I think four, four did it perfectly where there's that gas station right when you exit the vault and you can basically set up shop at that gas station and be like, this is my um, base of operations. And I'm going to go out and travel and scavenge and do things. And so, like, I feel like 4 perfected that. 4 also perfected the, <coughs> I want to pick up everything. And so uh, everything has a use now. Instead of just picking up everything and selling it, you can actually pick it all up and then build things with it. So I think, like, 4 kind of, like, solidified um, what I would consider, like, a great fallout experience for me though i do like three and new vegas how you can feed weapons to other weapons and kind of like uh increase their durability or repair them that way mm -hmm. so resource management in general like makes a good game for me um i'll give an honorable mention to bioshock because i played all of those and enjoyed the heck out of them as well um, yes sir there you know it was also just a a good memory for me getting to play those with all my friends at the same time and yeah. getting to basically say like, Oh, when you got to the end of infinite, what did you, you know, what did you think? Like, did it like completely catch you off guard? And for me, I'm exactly like that. Like I never pick up on the cues. I always get to yeah. an end of a game and I'm completely blown away. I'm like, Oh my gosh. So infinite was that for me. It was just like, I can't believe this it was awesome. Yeah. I, I, and I, I remember a lot you guys talking about that on the podcast. And of course, I mean, I, I, I think it was probably around that time that I played through all of them back to back. But yeah, that's fantastic. And of course, you know, Gabe wrote the song about Bioshock Infinite and performed. That oh, yeah. Cool. I shared a story on the Discord about it. Uh, you know, when he wrote that song, I was like, this song is so awesome. Like, mm. we need to get Ken Levine to at least listen to this song. Yep. Because, like, he has to understand how much we love this game. And uh, so I sent it to him every which... Like, I sent it to his PR team. I sent it to him on Twitter. Like, um, I, I'm, I sent him to him via email. Like, I sent it all over the place. I was like, please. Yeah. Hey, maybe maybe he did. So, maybe he Who knows? It. It, it would be funny if, like, it appeared in his, his latest game that's coming up, Judas. Just like randomly, you'd hear it on the radio in the background. I mean, I, I know that there's no way it ever will, but it would be hilarious if it did. It would be awesome. It would be so awesome. Well, on on the flip side, um, what was a game or game series that was completely off your radar initially, but ended up being something you loved? Uh, so, and I yeah, I know we used to bring up Minecraft a lot on the podcast, but mm. I totally slept on minecraft i think mm -hmm. it's so awesome um my mm. so when my daughter was i think she was probably close she was close to four so yeah she was still three 
Uh, we were playing Minecraft on because it was on Game Pass, mm-hmm. and I was like, you know, here's like a fun thing that you can get into because she was just learning how to game. I mean, by that time she could already use an Xbox controller, so I wasn't nice. like, super concerned. But um, like she was, you know, wanting to game, but wasn't ready for narrative type stuff or mm-hmm. like more complex games like yeah. she is today. She's seven today, but. Um, uh, so yeah, Minecraft was a great game for her and I to play together because we could, it was like playing Legos together. Like when she wanted the game, cause we play with Legos, we played with Play-Doh, like we played with all that stuff back then, but wanting to do something that dad does, like wanting the game and getting to do that together with Minecraft. I mean, it was a, it was an awesome time and I absolutely loved it. I was like, we were building little houses. We were filling them with a bunch of cats because we only we only play creative mode. But yeah, we would build these houses and just fill them with cats because she <laughs> loves cats. And uh, just filling the world with birds and bees and like uh, fish and all kinds of stuff. Just, I mean, literally just spawning like all kinds of animals. So it was a it was a blast. And so um, yeah, Minecraft definitely was something that I slept on that. I realize now is a fantastic game. So that is really cool to hear. Yeah, of course you say your daughter loves cats. It's like my daughter's exactly the same way. I mean she, she's yeah. younger younger than yours, but um you'd say I love kitties and I love Bowser because <laughs> she loves Bowser. Um but <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a uh, it's good stuff. That's that's funny with the Minecraft. I I, I I would love to try and do that with some of my kids. I mean, I, like I've never gotten into Minecraft. It's just been kind of I'm not really into the creative stuff. But my oldest son, especially, um, w- is like super technical. He has the way his mind works, and um, like he's had some Minecraft betting that he got years ago. And I'm like, I want him to be able to play Minecraft. But the problem is, the only way that I can do that is either if I let him play on one of the platforms where it actually has Minecraft, like either my switch or my 3ds or my one of my pcs or if i get him his own platform that can play it and i i've been hesitant i've just been hesitant to move him forward because i want him to be able to enjoy more of the games on 2ds because that's what what he has before i start bringing him forward because i'm like when we were kids you know there's just such a massive number of games available today compared mm-hmm. to what, what they were when we were kids that it's just like overwhelming and I, i'm trying not to overwhelm him so just like let him enjoy what he has before i start moving him in that direction but i also feel like yeah. maybe i should just let him I and mean, we have a second pc i could probably just you know get minecraft on there and let him do that during like free time when he's done with school or whatever but anyway yeah that's still really uh, cool. you I think, you know, I think the reason that, and it, it'll be great when you uh, give him a chance to play it, because I, I mm-hmm. think the, the thing that was missing when we were kids was we wanted that game where you could do pretty much anything. Mm-hmm. And Minecraft is kind of that in a, like, in a way where it has good limitations, where mm-hmm. you can, like, kind of use your creativity to get around, like, uh, structural problems when you're building stuff. Yeah. And... It, ha- it has a set of rules, but enough freedom to where I'm like, I would have loved this game when I was a kid because when yeah. we were kids, we wanted those games where you could kind of uh, have more freedom uh, within, I-, I guess, within like a game world to be able to like, like I said, like build your stuff. Like SimCity, for example. Like SimCity was super popular when we were young. I played the mm-hmm. crap out of that game. But... You know, there were technical limitations. With Mm -hmm. Minecraft, I feel like those technical limitations are kind of removed. So you can build an entire city. You can make the streets look exactly the way you want. You can fill your hotels with a bunch of cats. Like You can do pretty much whatever you want. It's so awesome. So that, like I said, enjoying that with my daughter, like we, I mean, she, she will build these just amazing little cities and I'm just like so proud because it's like like I said using that creative ingenuity mm. uh, building structures and like I said filling them with cats and I yeah. couldn't be happier so 
Yeah, I'll have to keep that in mind. Definitely, I would definitely play games with, with my kids and, and it's been good, but uh, I haven't tried Minecraft, so. Luckily for them, they don't have to go through the curation of like what we went through going to video game stores right. and having to yeah. rent a game based on the back of the box. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I feel like gaming is full of worthwhile experiences now yeah. and you don't have to just take a risk on too much stuff. I mean, even on PC, like, they have a return policy, so yep. you don't have to feel like you're taking a risk necessarily on games, with, especially with such a giant library. And you right. think about... The 360 era was, I mean, technologically, sure, we've come a far way, but games haven't evolved very much since right. like the mid mid 360 generation. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and those games are over over 10 years old. Those are 14 year old games at this right. point. I mean, Fallout 3 is 16 years old, and yeah. it's still super enjoyable today. And it's still like if you have it on a Series X, I mean, it's 60 frames at 4k you know it's yeah. absolutely i mean everything's being brought forward and for a good reason you know because yeah. they're still good games so definitely well we talked quite a bit about gaming but of course this is dads in gaming so let's start to get in the direction of being a dad uh but first i need to just ask what is it that you do for a living so uh, when we were doing the podcast, I was kind of early in my audio career. Uh, when I moved, when I had just left the podcast about a year after uh, we all moved to LA and I got into like special projects in the music industry. Um, I work for a contract team <clears throat> at Warner Music and we do kind of like um, the team back in LA, I, I'm actually working remote now and we'll, I will kind of get into that, but the team mm -hmm. back in LA does film pools and archiving, um, and like video masters. So like when a video is sent in from a production team, we prepare the, um, masters for, you know, Spotify, Apple, like all the different DSPs, uh, di digital service providers. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, so what I do now that I'm remote, uh, and I've been remote for about, I think, four years now, um, I'm still working for the L.A. team. Uh, the Warner L.A., like, or well, the Warner catalog team goes out and makes catalog acquisitions internationally. Mm. And then my job is when those uh, assets are brought in, assets being like the digital masters, um, I'm basically a, the first point at evaluating the quality so if we get a bunch of masters in and they're compressed, you know, or they're, say, we're asking for, like, full quality masters and we get MP3s, it's kind of my turn to, like, stop it there and kind of mention, like, hey, here's some of the quality standards that we have and, like, here's what you'll need to meet when you're sending in assets. And then I get them um, kind of set up and for um, QC and then distribution. So... Uh, they come into our team. I write some code that takes care of like the renaming and uh, then, yeah, schedule them to the team and then they're uh, QC'd and sent to distribution if they pass QC. So on an individual yeah. basis. And then I'm also like doing video masters from here. So I have a computer over in LA that I log into and work on the masters while I'm over here. So uh, nice. in Knoxville, Tennessee. So. Very cool. Yeah, I, I love how, how far um, technology is coming when it comes to working remotely, because I remember like when I first moved out here, I mean, I, I, I think I think that it was before I, I mean that like a lot of places were already more or less ahead. But like I was I would be doing remote work for my job back in Alaska for a little bit. And um, the VPN we were using was just unbelievably slow. And of course, it was also connecting to like actual remote servers that were up there and so mm. uh, at the time i was doing accounting stuff and the accounting software you know it used to be i was i had been so like used to everything that i'd punch in a number tab over to the next box you know just going through things very fast and because of how slow it was through the vpn it'd be like i'd punch in the numbers tap 
wait, wait. And then it would get to the next box and it was just painful. And now, I mean, like I, I work from home the majority of the time and I don't have any of those issues. I mean, granted, we're using mostly like Microsoft Office and things like that. I'm only having to connect to a VPN once in a while. And even that's only for things that are specifically like server side down in Houston. Um, mm. But it's, uh, I, I, I just love how, how much farther it's come since then. And, and the fact that you can do video stuff from from Tennessee, you know, that's, that's even better. Uh, working with Excel though. Yeah. Like I, I do work with Excel a lot and mm. I like being able to do that from my home machine and then right. upload it for uh, the offices there. So yeah. And if I you definitely... do it all through 365, then it's instantaneous. So, Oh yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Well, uh, now we get into the dad questions. So how long have you been a dad? Uh, I mentioned earlier, my daughter is seven now and she turns eight this month. And it was crazy because her due date was my birthday as well. <laughs> so, and I really didn't want her to like have to share a birthday. Like mm-hmm. I didn't want her to feel like her day was overshadowed. Yeah. Um, and so she actually ended up coming the day before my birthday. So I, I literally just celebrate her birthday. I'm 37. I'm like, I don't. Need right. a birthday anymore. Right. Like, I I just enjoy getting to see her enjoy her day. So, uh, but yeah, she turns eight this month. That's very cool. Uh, well, how has your experience been as a dad? Uh, I tell this to everybody: life changes in a major way yep. uh, because it's a it is a humbling experience mm-hmm. to know that like you are uh, caring for someone else like raising them and uh yeah i mean it's been an amazing experience because i felt like before i was a father like my purpose was like so much tied to my work Mm -hmm. and you know after becoming a father yeah so much of it is tied to just just being a dad and raising my daughter in the best way i can and so like I know that before you have kids, like you hear people say that and you're kind of like, it's hard to understand, I think. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you do have kids of your own, yeah, like it, life changes. That's just how I can sum it up. Agreed. What's the most surprising thing you've learned in parenting over these last eight years, almost eight years? (sighs) Oh, yeah. Um, Gosh, there, there's a, I will say there's a nervousness that comes with parenting. It's Mm -hmm. like you want to do everything you can, uh, to not be a helicopter parent and to let them have experiences, but also you want to just protect them the best you can. hundred percent. And so I would say like, it was so surprising to me. Um, the anxiety that comes with parenting. Like now I know what my mom meant when she would like, when people would say like, do you know where your child is? Like, and you know, they would say that in commercials and people would be like, you know, Oh, gasp. Like, Oh my gosh. You know, like, yeah, I totally get it now because I would feel that exact same way. Mm -hmm. Like I want to make sure my daughter is well taken care of and Mm -hmm. I want to be, (laughs) <laughs> I want to do everything I can to not be that helicopter parent yeah. while uh, at the same time, like definitely wanting to be that helicopter parent. So right. exactly. it's a balance, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, it was surprising to me. That's very cool to hear that. Yep. I, I agree completely. hundred percent feel exactly the same way. Um, what is something you wish you had realized sooner when it comes to parenting? This is kind of a, like, funny topic it's like so many people tell you like oh by the second one you'll be a pro and what they usually mean by that i think is that you realize like not everything is is an emergency right you know if your child walks in and has projectile vomit all of a sudden it's like maybe they ate too much or you know maybe you didn't burp them well enough you know you learn about the burping thing because you know my daughter poor thing yeah she had a little bit of 
she had a little bit of vomiting because we were learning how to burp her properly. Mm -hmm. And like, once you understand that, like, oh, second and third one, yeah, that would be much easier. I I only have one, but uh, I'm sure if I did have a second and a third in the future, I I mean, I'm already prepared for it, you know. The everything's not an emergency. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And that's that's completely true. I will say, though, that... um, no guarantees on the second and third one because usually they're completely different from each other. Um, That's true. Because I mean, like yeah. my my, you know, after after our first one, you know, we we had our second, and he actually the projectile vomiting was something that he did frequently, and it was because he ate too much. But it was specifically um, while he was a baby. So he's this this boy very much takes after his father and is all about the food, and so. When, when he would be drinking his formula, because we we, did, we decided to do formula with, with our second and third. He, I mean, if you tried to take the bottle out of his mouth so that you could burp him, he would scream. He would just get so upset. Why are you taking away my food? And we, we try to burp him and he'd just be like arching his back and he wouldn't let us burp him. I mean, you know, we, we would most of the time eventually be able to, but because he would do that and wouldn't burp like he needed to, he would end up projectile vomiting the the formula that he drank up because he drank too much. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it's just you said that, and I was just, I was just remembering that that memory of of him as a kid. And I mean, he's he's seven now, or well, well, he'll be seven later this year. But um, you know, still very much all about the food. And uh, I don't know, I just thought that was really funny. But e- either way, yeah. you know, the the reality is, like you said. Not everything is an emergency when, when you exactly when you, and when, when you go from one kid to the next, it's like it. I, I still maintain going from zero to one is the hardest. After that, it's I mean, even though there's challenges, of course, with it and, you know, the fact that the kids are different and all that makes a difference. But going from zero to one is the hardest because you're going from probably having like no idea what you're doing to at least having some idea. And mm. not quite being panicked in the same way if you feel like you don't know what you're doing, because you have at least some experience. Like, okay, well, I know that we can we can do this. You know, it may not be exactly the same with every kid, but in general, you know, I know that I can make one survive. I can keep one alive. I can probably keep two alive. <laughs> and yep. go from there. <laughs> Everyone that's, tells I mean, me that's that, how that's how I feel. like. If I were having a second one, I would know. You know. Like, for example, like Rogue, like had hit her head one time Mm. and I was like so concerned and and called grandma and grandma was like, well, I mean, you know, what's what are her eyes doing? Is she, you know, throwing up or whatever? Like having grandma there to say Mm. like, hey, it's okay." Like she might have hit her head, but she doesn't have a concussion. She'll be all right. Like, you know, knowing, like I said, that not everything is an emergency. It's like, yeah, okay. Now I would be, you know, more prepared in the future. So. Or I feel like it anyway. So, so of course, with being a dad and having a having a job that, you know, undoubtedly keeps you very busy, how do you find time to game? So luckily, a lot of the game experiences I enjoy now, like, I mean, I, th- I feel like Nintendo's just been crushing it since they released the Switch. So we bought, like almost every release like I feel like that they've had since like 2020 um so since like my daughter and I play a lot of those games together that's kind Mm -hmm. of where a lot of my game time comes in um a lot of like I'll play on like maybe Friday nights Saturday nights well no Friday nights and Sunday nights usually uh like if I'm playing multiplayer with friends Mm -hmm. Um, but like single player experiences, like it's been really hard for me to jump back in those just cause they're such a big time investment. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, yeah. And really like a lot of stuff will hit game pass and then go on my backlog. And so yeah. my backlog has gotten so long. So I guess the answer to that question is how I can't find time to game typically, but um, I do game a lot with my daughter, though, so that yeah, like, that's really good. is where a lot of my time, my game time comes in. That's really uh, we good. We played, uh, most recently, I think we played uh, Minecraft Dungeons. Okay. And that game is so, like, it scratches the itch because Diablo 4 came out, for example. Right. I have Diablo 4, but I haven't even 
booted it up. Mm. But the fact that I've played Minecraft Dungeons with my daughter a lot has mm. kind of scratched that itch. Like, nice. it's a very similar game. So, Yeah, that's very cool. Very, very it's cool. on the backlog. The backlog is so long. I mean, well, I, I don't think you can count Game Pass <laughs> as your backlog, though, because the reality is that you didn't you didn't buy any of those games. I mean, yes, technically True. you're paying for it, but you know. But it, I, I would say, like personally, I only think of something as part of my backlog if I paid for it. Otherwise, gotcha. I don't think I don't think of it as part of my backlog. That that helps me sleep. At night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously, because <laughs> I would have so many. And those, well, those games, what I do is I download them. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to play that. And it's just, <laughs> it, the next time I see that game is when I'm deleting it to put another one on. So yeah. it happens all the time. And those games fall off a of game pass too. So, mm. I mean, you know, you may lose uh, access to it too. So that kind of sucks. Yeah. What tips would you give for people who are struggling to find the time to game, you know, with with kids, with wives, nine fives, all that? I think you just got to schedule it like a part time job. So mm -hmm. if you make a time like, say, for example, you have a group of guys that you play with, uh, schedule that time and say, like, hey, Friday at 8 p.m., we're going to play X, Y or Z like every Friday, mm -hmm. uh, because then it kind of feels like a job. And if yeah. you're kind of creating a part-time job out of it, it's like you'll get the game, you'll get your time in. Think about it as like a, an investment in friendships. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really, I mean, that's c kept me connected with those friends who I play gears with. That's a good way to think about it. Very cool. Well, since your parenting experience is with just raising a daughter, what are some tips you'd give to other dads of daughters? I mean, I can just sum it up. I know I've been all over the place with a lot of answers and I kind of expand upon a lot of things, but this one's pretty easy. I mean, you just give them your time. Mm -hmm. uh, with little boys, like it's easy to like, and like friends who I have who are dads of little boys, like they will take them to the park and just let them like run and do their own thing. And just, I mean, that's what little boys like really want to do in my like from what I've seen, but with little girls, they are like, it feels like they're so, they're so much closer to their parents and value the time that they get with them. So mm -hmm. really nothing says, I love you more than I'm going to give you my time. What do you want to do? And so with my daughter, it's like, I get, I get off of work and I say like, what do you want to do? You want to go to the park? Do you want to play some video games? Do you want to play some Pokemon cards? Like, what do you want to do? And so, just giving her my time. You know, if you're a dad of a daughter, give them your time because I think that creates um, a lot of self-worth in daughters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas yeah, little boys, I, th I feel like, I mean, it, having grown up with uh, a mom who let me just go out and bike miles from my home when I was a kid, like adventure was what I needed, you know, mm -hmm. as a little boy. But my sister, whom I grew up with, she wanted more time with mom and dad. Yeah. And so I can't say that that's the same for every kid, but in my experience and talking with dads that I know today, that's kind of been the consensus. That's good to know. I mean, my since my daughter is younger than yours, you know, it's just something that I need to keep in mind more because I, I would say I probably don't get nearly enough time with my daughter, but most of the time when I'm not working, she's playing with her cats or, um, you know, telling <laughs> stories or reading or whatever. So, <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. But ho hopefully, hopefully one of these days we'll be ready to let her start playing video games. I've held off only because for a long time, my daughter's uh, tendency when she got mad was to throw whatever she was holding. So I, <laughs> I've had a 2DS sitting in my drawer waiting to give to her. That's pink because, you know, she's a girl and she loves pink. And um, I've, I've had it sitting there for probably a couple of years now because I've been waiting for the time that she was finally ready to actually give it a try. And I want to do that for her and hopefully find a game with Bowser is what I need to do because she loves Bowser. Bowser's inside story. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was thinking that was a possibility, I mean, it, but the problem is that does have a lot of reading. And I mean, she, mm. she, she reads pretty well, but I, 
I don't know. I'll, I'll have to look around and see what options there are. Um, yeah. I mean, there's there's always, you know, there's obviously like Mario Kart and stuff too. So. Oh, yeah. It, totally. It'll be interesting. Yeah, start with the easier ones. Bowser's Inside Story is a little bit, uh, little bit deep, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, that's definitely later. And it's an RPG and all that. So. Right, exactly. So we'll see what happens with that. All right. Well, uh, we just have one more dad related question here. And that is I want your best dad joke or your worst, depending on how you look at it. <sighs> yeah, it's pretty bad. Uh, why wasn't the skeleton invited to the party? Because he had nobody to go with. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'll take it. It's bad. <laughs> uh, no, I'll take it. I love it. I, I, I share dad jokes. I, I've been sharing dad jokes with my coworkers every work day since, uh, since last year. So more dad. It jokes is expected from me. Yes. Yeah. Every time we get on a zoom call at work, it's expected. So excellent. Like here's Tim and his cheesy joke. So. Yeah. But it's it's a it is a requirement of the job of being a dad is to tell dad jokes. One hundred percent. So. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, any final thoughts for this evening? No, I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, your questions kind of covered everything. You know, I really appreciate you having me uh, come and speak on your show. Um, I think what you're doing here is great, uh, kind of connecting uh, us dads in this gaming world. And, <laughs> you know, um, I would say uh, if anybody wants to uh, connect with me, yeah, I mean, I'm over on the Married to the Games Discord. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you, join, if you go to their website, you can uh, join over there. And, like, this is, you know, kind of coming back... Um, uh, to the community like I'm, I'm here I'm here for good um, Very we good. have got a good thing going on over here and I want to do everything I can to support the community and be a part of it so I really appreciate you having me on and um, it was really great talking to you oh, it was my pleasure I'm, I'm so glad that after all these years I finally get to talk to you and now mm -hmm. if, if there's an episode 700 you need to try to try to show up there so i and, will 100 percent be there <laughs> for sure well lord willing anyway <laughs> i'm looking forward to it that would um, be very cool yeah i have a question for you actually mm -hmm. are you still the frozen gamer because now you're in Missouri. So, so i i still consider myself from the great cold state of alaska because i lived there for almost 18 years so, oh yeah, I spent I spent more than half of my life there, almost all of my adult life in Alaska. Mm -hmm. So, and it very much shaped who I am, and it's where I got most heavily into gaming. Even though obviously I started in California and have been in Missouri now for about almost three years. So. Yeah, yeah, that's so awesome though. I mean, living in Alaska had has to have been a very unique experience. You know, it absolutely was. <laughs> yes. I always always have stories. Always, always, always. But, yeah. I'm glad I am where I am. So. For sure. All right. Well, until next time, this has been The Frozen Gamer 87 with Timothy Hall, founder of Married to the Games, one of the three founders of Married to the Games. And in honor of the late and the great Gabe Patillo. We are about this thing. Peace.